Welcome to Sightlines. I'm your host, Dr. Hunter Cherwick, Vice President of Clinical Services at Orbis International. Orbis is an international not-for-profit, and we've been working to address global blindness and vision impairment for about four decades. That's because there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who are blind or visually impaired, and the vast majority of these cases could be treated or even completely prevented. In this series, we're looking at how the pandemic has affected the fight against global blindness and at how we're navigating the situation using different technologies, creative solutions, and innovations. One technology we've been developing for decades is paying off in a big way during the pandemic. That's CyberSight, our e-learning and telemedicine platform. An important thing to keep in mind about CyberSight is that it only exists because we began investing in it decades ago, in the early days of the internet. So today, we're going to take a look at the next frontier, the most recent advancements in technology and their potential to help save sight around the world. Specifically, we'll look at why Orbis has added AI or artificial intelligence to our toolkit in the fight against global blindness. We'll also take a look at the role of simulation, how it is helping take training for eye health professionals to the next level, and how that's facilitating training during this time of physical distancing. My first two guests are Dr. Michael Abramoff, the founder and chairman of Digital Diagnostics, and Dr. Nicholas Jacquard, the principal AI architect at Orbis International. Here's our conversation. First up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Abramoff. He's joining us from Iowa, where he is a professor at the university and the founder of an incredible company that is now bringing autonomous artificial intelligence to help treat eye diseases. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, your academic background, and how you got started in artificial intelligence. From my accent, you can hear I was born in Iowa. I was born in the Netherlands. Uh, came here from Amsterdam 17 years ago. I have an interesting background, you may say, or people tell me, um, because I, um, I'm also a computer engineer, I worked for a long time in neuroscience, so I can call myself a neuroscientist. I actually have a degree in epidemiology, but we won't talk about it. And, and so um, with that background and where I was mimicking uh, brain cells 30 years ago with neural networks, very simple neural networks, one layer neural networks that essentially mimic brains and their, inter uh, sorry, neurons and their interactions, um, it was sort of, obvious as machine learning got off to a, a more efficient start um, that when I became a resident in ophthalmology and saw all these patients with diabetes either not getting their eye exams or on the contrary coming in very late where they also have irreversible damage and then knowing that it's easily preventable if you catch it early I thought well maybe a computer can do a better job and become also more accessible and lower cost. And so we spent a lot of time um, essentially figuring out, and maybe we can talk about it later, what is the right way to validate AI? How should we build it? What should it actually be doing? How do we prove that? Many details that hadn't been worked out and that culminated in, in, in 2018 FDA saying, well, we authorize this uh, autonomous AI for marketing in the US, meaning you can now use it on patients. And now for the first time ever, Medicare decided to pay for an autonomous AI for the diabetic eye exam. So that's probably a bigger achievement than, than even FDA clearance because there's so much involved in these decisions. So on the one hand, it shows that the healthcare system wasn't prepared at all, but is now very ready and embracing it because really everyone we work with on this road is very enthusiastic and they want to try to make it work. It's just that the healthcare system is also very complex. And so it's just hard to change what was so far done by human doctors. I mean, usually many rules and regulations say it needs to be a doctor, a human doing this. And then, you know, how do we change that? Maybe you can just take a minute and make sure everyone is clear. When you say autonomous AI, when I put my head and have a picture taken of my eye, what does autonomous AI mean? I just want to make sure that's crystal clear for everyone. The exam is done right then and there within minutes, and there's no human oversight of the medical decision. It's still discussed with the patient, typically by a doctor. So the doctor is still in the picture, but it's not an ophthalmologist anymore or an optometrist. 
And so it means the computer makes the medical decision, makes the call whether this is diabetic retinopathy. Just so people know, I mean, you really are the first person in all of medicine, not just ophthalmology, yeah. all of medicine to have FDA approval for our, uh, autonomous artificial intelligence. That's a huge milestone in all of medicine. And so just congratulations to you and your team. We're so excited to partner with you and look at how we can do research together to improve productivity of eye health professionals around the world. So it's a really big honor to have you here with us on Sightlines. I also want to welcome the CyberSight Principal Architect for Artificial Intelligence. We also are using artificial intelligence uh, on our platform, CyberSight. Uh, Nicholas, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, where you are now during COVID, and very much uh, like Dr. Abramoff, you yourself are an academic with a PhD, you're an entrepreneur, you're an engineer, so you two are going to get along very well, and I might just drop off this call and let you all keep talking, because I don't think I'm going to be doing much here, because certainly you all are going to be the intellectuals doing the heavy lifting. Thanks, Hunter. Um, so I'm currently based in London, but as you can hear from my accent, I'm not actually from London, uh, from the UK. I actually grew up in, in Switzerland. Um, and I'm originally, my undergrad was in biotechnology engineering. So I was actually working on things like protein production or vaccine production. And my career was set to be in pharma. Um, but I had a chance to come to London for a six month project at the end of my bachelor degree. And I basically uh, fell in love with, it, with London, first of all. So I decided to stay. And I was offered in a, a place for a PhD at University College London. Pretty much since it, towards the end of my PhD through now, I've been working with deep learning. So this new kind of fancy machine learning approach. I was contacted by Orbis and I was told that there was this position opening at Orbis. Um, and I didn't have to think much before accepting it because since my days in uh, the first startup I worked at, I actually interacted with Orbis a bit there. And that the Orbis project that I worked on became a kind of a uh, passion project of mine. And I really enjoyed the time spent working with Orbis. Coming to Orbis was such, such a huge amount of domain knowledge. Every day I talked with someone new at Orbis and discover something new we are doing around the world. Um, and it's very inspiring. And again, it's been a day, a dream job for me at Orbis. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed it. You get to work with me. I mean, what else could you Perfect. want out yeah. of life? I mean, really? Uh, so, you know, Michael, I, I really, I think, you know, I visited you in February, which is not the ideal time to go to Iowa when the snow and it was negative 10 the morning I came to your office. Did you ever negative think- Negative 10 Fahrenheit uh, for the listeners outside. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> I, I apologize, correct. Uh, mm -hmm. How very American of me and how, how very uh, appropriate of you to correct me. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, it was such an, just so exciting to walk in your office and feel your team's energy and how you want to globalize your, your product. Can you talk about already how you're not only working within the U.S., but you have installations and partners in Poland? I mean, how has this built out? How fast is this growing, this field of autonomous AI that you are leading? How fast is this growing around the world? And, and how is this realizing your dream to help prevent avoidable blindness? In one province in Poland, they're doing all the diabetic eye exams with IDXDR. We're in Austria in a pretty big way, in Holland, you know, obviously because I have still connections there. Um, uh, Germany, so there's several places in, in, in Europe. Middle East comes to mind, of course, where we have some installations. And then, you know, very uh, exciting. I, I don't know whether you want me to mention the name of the country we're working together, but Bangladesh. And what is especially exciting to me is the reason I founded this company was to save healthcare costs and make quality better and make it more accessible everywhere around the world. And productivity and improving productivity is really the key to that. We have never studied how autonomous AI benefits productivity. You have great expectations, but it would be so great to prove that for the first time ever. And that's what we hope to do together. And that's really so exciting uh, to me.
like you said, it's so exciting to see how technology is advancing so rapidly. And I mean, I can imagine scanning slides in the 80s. Now with your iPhone, you're able to take better photos than people could five, 10 years ago. Uh, you know, it, it is exciting time to be alive with technology. And you are strategically driving it to the places where Orbis works and where it's needed most. And I just want to officially thank you for that because it's so exciting to be partnering and learning with you and working with on CyberSight. You know, Nicholas, I, I'd love to hear how your experience being part of this CyberSight team, how we're applying artificial intelligence to consults and more for machine mentoring, not independent, not like what Michael's doing with autonomous AI. How are we using AI and how have you seen that already helping the Orbis mission? Yep, so as you mentioned, we're, we're not touching autonomous AI for now, at least for the foreseeable future. We are mostly focusing on two aspects, which is providing clinical decision tools. So tools that help healthcare professionals in low to middle income countries to make the best possible decision when they see a patient and also tools that can be useful for training or mentoring. The way our users interact with AI uh, in, in terms of diagnostics is so far through CyberSight uh, Consult, which is our telemedicine platform, whereby a user, uh, which is typically a healthcare professional in a low to middle income country, can submit a patient case to the system. And typically those are complex patient cases where the local professional needs some help to really understand the case and come up with the appropriate diagnosis and thus appropriate treatment for the patient. And once the case in this is in the system, it is paired up with a mentor, uh, with typically an expert ophthalmologist, for example, somewhere in the UK or somewhere in the US or elsewhere in Europe. And together they work on the case. Um, so it's the benefit of this is twofold. You have um, better outcome for the patient, through this collaboration and also through this um, collaboration, you have a kind of a mentoring and training of the local healthcare professional. Um, the way we integrated AI is this workflow is uh, instead of when you submit a patient case, you can opt in. So it's opt in, it's not by default. You can opt in to also submit uh, ophthalmic imagery, which are typically a back of the eye image to uh, for automated interpretation by the system. And what that does is your case still goes to a mentor and the mentor will uh, also see the AI outputs uh, as part of that workflow. But before you get a response for your mentor, you get a AI report typically uh, within a minute of submitting the patient case. So not only is that useful for diagnosis purposes and for to show, uh, to give the best possible care to the patient, it's also useful for the local healthcare professional to learn from it. Yeah, and so I think that's where the partnership with Dr. Abramoff's company works so well with Orbis is, you know, we're looking at AI for training and building up human resources and customized learning on CyberSight. He's, and that's all being supervised by a human. Dr. Abramoff is really looking at patient care, direct diagnostics, and without a human supervisor, that his is autonomous. You know, Michael, you obviously have been not just driving this from a medical standpoint, but from an ethics standpoint, from you know, a regulatory standpoint, from a security and patient privacy, you all have been, both of you have been looking at how AI is affecting the entire ecosystem. And so maybe we can just talk for a bit. You start, Nicholas, because I know Michael talked about this with the evolution with his first ever FDA approval for AI the ethics, security, and privacy. Maybe we can just talk about how, as we bring out any new technology to the market and to the public, we always need to th think about those things. So Nicholas, maybe you can start. I agree that these three things are some things that need to be thought about. And as Michael said, it's not only something you think about, you know, at the end when you have something and, you know, you want to productize it and have user uh, uh, use it. You want to think about it from the design uh, phase. You want to build ethics, security, and privacy into your product from the start, uh, into all your processes. And this is something that part of it is also forced onto you by regulation. So if you have a quality management system, some of these aspects are mandatory that you have to make sure that, you know, for 
uh, data security and uh, privacy concerns and so on, you have some regulations around these aspects. But I think really the, the most important, I think the most um, uh, spoken about of these three is probably ethics. And I think it's, a very, um, it's very important um, to take the time to talk about it. And we've seen until even very recently here in the UK when you had a algorithm you know, giving grades to uh, students. And if you were a student from a, uh, um, a deprived area, you were way more likely to get lower marks, given lower marks by this algorithm or lower grades compared to someone going to a prestigious school in London or um, in the more uh, affluent areas of the UK. And this is a, an example of basically um, massive biases in your data sets um, just because, you know, historically these deprived areas did, uh, didn't do as well. It meant that according to the algorithms, they will never be able to do better because he only looks at, you know, recent historical trends and that's how it extrapolates. And I think this is very important to be able to think about these aspects uh, from the very, uh, from the very beginning of work on a new AI product. And there are many different um, biases you may want to think about. Um, one is, uh, and I think it's important in healthcare, is uh, something called measurement bias, whereby uh, even before you go to the machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms, the way you measure something can be biased uh, depending, for example, your ethnicity. So it's known that some dermal image, uh, uh, some imaging used in dermatology, for example, um, will not give as good results when used on a uh, on darker skin skin tone. I started worrying very early on about uh, racial and ethnic bias and bias in general that we built into our machine learning algorithms. And for me, it was pretty obvious that if you build an AI for detecting diabetic retinopathy or other diseases that you look for what clinicians already do, which is look for hemorrhages and then microns and exudates. So that's what we build machine learning, deep learning based detectors for. But that builds in an invariance to race and ethnicity and the background color of the retina, because it doesn't matter what background color the retina is. If you have a hemorrhage and an exudate, it's likely diabetic retinopathy. So you avoid this whole problem of making sure, which is almost, well, in my view, impossible to guarantee that your training set cons contains all variants that is there in the natural population so that you are sure you are not excluding a certain race or ethnicity from you know from high performance and so that way we are we are able to address that even from the from the design rather than just in the validation which is as important of course and so i you know embrace very much this this biomark approach i i really think that's the way to go where we can this is becoming as important as the actual machine learning engineering is to really understand these ethical and these, these biases in the data and is a machine learning algorithm themselves. I think ethics is a, is a tool. It doesn't tell you what to do. It's just a way of analyzing uh, what you can do. And so you still need to make decisions afterwards of how will I apply ethics to, in this case, AI. So we already talked about the biomarkers, which is at least you know, a safer way of doing it. And the other way is, of course, validating you can never examine your AI on all the population it will be used on. That's 450 million people in the, in the world, 30 million people in the US. So you have to take a sample and that's accepted, but the sample, you know, it will never represent every, all 30 million people. So you need to choose the sample wisely. I think that's something, you know, I appreciate you both commenting on. Obviously we need to think about this as humans as well as technicians and clinicians. But I'd like to hear from maybe Michael first and then Nicholas. Where do you see the field of autonomous AI in the next 10 years? And where do you see its applications and impact for what we do at Orbis and global ophthalmology? I expect uh, to have autonomous AIs for at least maybe 10 diseases. And let me explain why I said it and then expand a bit. So. It needs to be scalable. It needs to be a massive problem. Otherwise, it's so much investment and effort and cost in validation and getting the training data and doing the clinical trials that, that may not be worth it for Libra's congenital amaurosis with 3,000 subjects in the entire world, or maybe 5,000. And so you will see it for diseases like glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, 
uh, maybe sickle cell, maybe, you know, disease, AMD, other diseases like that, uh, malarial retinopathy. Those are the ones that cause the most suffering and the most, in this case for Orbis, blindness. So I think that's where we will be going. That's where it makes the most sense. And then aside from that, there is the other challenge that yes, we are now really good at diagnosing people who are at higher risk, but like I mentioned earlier, we still need to find solutions. What do we do these people once they're identified? Do we have the healthcare, the ophthalmology system? And that's, I think, you know, when residents and fellows ask me, what should I do? You're creating these AIs and they're taking away all the jobs. And I say, no, because we need more people in fact to treat these patients and to treat them well and, and, and in evidence-based ways. So I think that's where more and more the focus of Orbis will be because, uh, you know, to like you're already doing, educating the best ophthalmologists and the best other ancillary personnel so they can deal with all these, these massive wave of patients that deserve to be treated. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and Nicholas, maybe you can tell us, uh, you know, where you see both the field of autonomous AI and then as Michael has alluded to, where cyber state AI for training. So maybe you can talk about both those for diagnostics with autonomous and training and machine mentoring with cyber site AI. Maybe you can talk about that, where you see us in 10 years. I do think there will be kind of a, um, a period of time where there will be limited improvement of the technology itself uh, until there will be a next boom, maybe in 10 years or 15 years, 20 years. I do think though that where all the improvements will come is how we apply this technology that we already have, but also how we integrate it in you know, day-to-day -day workflows of clinicians, um, be it in um, uh, Western countries or more in developing countries and low and middle income countries. How do we make it as streamline as possible so that using it is actually not a bottleneck or yet another step in the process, but just built into the process and they get the benefits of it without any uh, negative impact on their day-to-day -day work. So I think understanding how AI helps and where it helps, um, as it was mentioned a few times during this, uh, this conversation is, there are low hanging fruits and we know that having AI for certain things like DR diagnosis will help a lot. But I, I do feel like there is a lot of areas where we think AI is going to help is the effect will be actually be negligible and other areas where we may not think that having this kind of technology may actually be helpful will turn out to be where it actually makes the most difference. I'm sure in five years, AI will be embedded in learning and teaching in ways that we can't even imagine now because as I said, I think we are biased in our ways that we, we think we know how we want to apply AI, but it will turn out that there will be many, many use cases that haven't even crossed our mind uh, at this stage and it will seem so obvious then, but um, I'm hopeful and excited that Orbis will be part of that journey on discovering where AI will actually be useful in that, in our mission to really teach and mentor these, um, these healthcare professionals in its communities. I just want to take a minute and thank you both. Like I said, I learn something from you all every day. The CyberSight team is just such a fascinating team and not trying to separate the digital divide, but close it so that we can democratize and globalize game-changing technology like what Dr. Abramoff and what you are doing with the CyberSight team. For me, that's the greatest pleasure I've had in medicine. That was Dr. Michael Abramoff and Dr. Nicholas Shikard, two absolutely brilliant minds. I want to thank them both for joining us on Sightlines. My next guest is Captain Cindy Berwin. Not only is Captain Berwin an incredible FedEx pilot who volunteers her time to fly the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital, she is also an expert on simulation. I am so pleased to have her as a guest today to discuss how simulation is playing an important role in advancing training and education, even from afar. Cindy, can't thank you enough for joining us today. How are you and how are things going with you and your family during this COVID time? I'm doing really great. I just had a new granddaughter that was born August 30th in North Carolina. So now I have three granddaughters. <laughs> so, and the family's doing great. Uh, you know, I'm, the virus has slowed things down, but not for FedEx. We're still busy working. So my, my paid job is still keeping me really, really busy. We get to do a lot of humanitarian relief. That's kind of cool. Sort of relates to the Orbis mission. And, uh, um, 
keeping my flying current, that's for sure. I'm still all over the world. Yes. Well, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started in aviation, what drew you to the field, and what keeps you going? Because you've accomplished so much in aviation. What keeps you driving as a perpetual student of aviation? So that's always a hard question for me to answer with a with a smooth answer <laughs> because I, I can't remember exactly what got me interested. I remember as a child dreaming that I could fly, you know, personally fly. <laughs> and uh, um, maybe that was a safe space for me, you know, could, it's a way of getting away from uh, people that are not so nice to you or whatever. I don't know. It just was really a cool thing to look down. I used to love to hike. I still do. But uh, um, just kind of a neat thing and then the opportunity presented itself when I was a teenager uh, to go out and learn to fly joined Civil Air Patrol got involved with uh, glider flying and uh, small airplane flying started earning my certificates paid my way through college teaching flying and then the year I was a senior in college the uh, Air Force decided to accept women into pilot training and I applied in March Graduated in May and was accepted with the first class of uh, women that went directly from um, civilian. And there were a couple of classes ahead of me that were previous military, but the first class that came from civilian to come into the, to enter as a pilot. Uh, did that, taught flying in the Air Force for a few years, uh, then ended up flying uh, with the reserves, the Air Force Reserves, KC-10s, a uh, similar airplane to the Orbis airplane and uh, got hired by FedEx to fly for them. So I've been with them for 35 years. <laughs> and, and I've been volunteering with Orbis since 2012, I believe it was. And uh, so just love it, love the uh, aviation. And I've done a lot along the way. So I've flown seaplanes, sailplanes, hot air balloons, the Goodyear blimp, hot helicopters. Uh, uh, I've got ratings and a lot of different things. It's just fun. Well, Cindy, you know, one of the things I've admired and learned a lot about you is how you've used simulation in aviation training over the, the several years you've been with FedEx, but also throughout your entire career. Um, could you tell us what is simulation and how you as a pilot and as a trainer in aviation use simulation? So there's a lot of different levels of simulation, and one is a very basic level, what we call chair flying, and that's where you simulate in your own mind going through an event, and you go through step by step, what would I do, what would they say to me now, you know, what would I say back, and it, it involves nothing artificial, it's just you, you and your mind, or you and somebody asking you questions, and that simulates a flight by chair flying, by preparing and going through it in your mind. So that's the most basic level. Um, everybody knows now about video games. That's a level of simulation. And, and there's increasing levels of video games, more interaction, more, more or less. So you can, you, can, you can work with just the keypad. You can work with just the mouse and, and move things around and simulate by putting your little uh, arrow somewhere and say, okay, this is where I would want to go, but then you become increasingly complex by putting together what we have at FedEx and what they use at all the airlines and um, flight uh, safety training departments and uh, the military and stuff, and those are full flight simulators. And so they've got ones that have no motion, but they have all of the buttons and dials and controls, and they've got ones that come up on motion. And when you're flying one of those with the visuals and with all of the components, you don't know you're not in an airplane. It is so real. Um, the feelings, the, the G-forces, <laughs> the, uh, the turbulence, the, the vision, everything feels real. So the beauty of that is that you can practice everything. You can simulate um, loading somebody up when they get really busy and something goes wrong and how they would handle it. And there's, there's an advantage to, to practicing that. And I, I heard one of the NASA astronauts say one time that they practice, they simulate training so much that they, they train till they can't fail. They do it so much they can't fail. And, you know, we do that with, with walking as, as a child or with talking. We train so much till we can't fail, till we can walk across a room. Or, or I mean, that's very basic. But you can use that uh, for any, any skill set. You just practice it, how to, 
how to close a door quietly. I used to make my kids close the door 10 times quietly so they quit slamming it because <laughs> then you build up some motor memory there. And, <laughs> and, and there's just ways of using simulation or practice to, to build your, um, your muscle memory and your, and your thought process and do it right every time. Um, obviously, we can't afford in a, um, in a, airline training environment or even military training environment to train till you can't fail. So we train till you can succeed. And uh, so there's a, a balance between the, the time and the cost and, and what you get out of it. And you have to weigh all of those things as you develop your training programs to what an average learner would pick up, how much is going to be enough practice until they, they, they know what they're doing. And then, course in life they'll continue to practice as they operate aircraft throughout the world and they'll they'll develop the skill set even more yeah and I think one of the things I've always appreciated is and this is when I first stepped on Orbis one back in 2005 I saw so much wired and hardwired into your team and to your thinking where when you encounter a challenge you literally stop first control yourself and then walk through an algorithm and so that it's like a checklist. And I think we're now beginning in medicine to learn a lot from you in aviation. The use of checklist. Are the wings, check. Wheels, check. Now we're doing that with, this is Mrs. Jones, check. We're doing the right eye, check. Cataract surgery, check. But also that team approach where certainly there's control in the cockpit, but there is everyone's checking, everyone's supporting each other. We're doing that same thing now, taking that cockpit and putting it in the operating room. And as you've said, Orbis is now really leading the way. We look at things like Xbox, how they can re make these video games so lifelike. We want to look at how you can take Xbox into the OR. So, Perfect. Yeah, I I'm really excited for where the future of training is going. And I never thought when I was training as a resident almost 20 years ago, we'd be sitting here talking about simulators and artificial intelligence. It's just such an exciting time to be in training. One of the things, obviously, we've all been impacted by COVID and this new normal that we're living in. And do you see with social distancing where maybe the number of flights have gone down for certain airlines or the number of procedures that doctors are doing have gone down as hospitals were slowed down because of the lockdown? Do you see simulation as a way of maintaining skills yes. or is a way of allowing people to practice in a safe and socially distanced manner? Sure. So um, the FAA for pilots in the United States has a requirement for landing currency. You have to do three takeoffs and landings every 90 days. Well, the Orbis airplane hasn't been flying. And so to maintain currency in the airplane, we use the simulator to go in and practice three takeoffs and landings. Well, we have the simulator for a four hour block and you're not going to be a very proficient pilot if all you practice is takeoff and landings. So we practice crosswind takeoffs and landings. We pro practice engine failures. We practice um, uh, emergency procedures of many different types, looking for errors, looking to make sure we're still very competent with our, our systems knowledge and don't become complacent. I think the airlines that are, are suffering from a lack of flying right now are also very concerned about what it's going to do to their pilots and their proficiency. So they will come back and they, uh, once they start flying again, they have to determine how much training is going to be required, how much simulation. I don't know how you handle that in the medical business. You know, if, if you're a surgeon and you don't get to operate for uh, a year on some specialty, how do you bring that back? Is there simulation available? Because it would be very beneficial to, um, to practice with a knife on a simulator before you hit a person. You actually have to have the fine motor skills, right? No, you're exactly right. With well, that tactile sensation, the haptic feeling of what does the tissue feel like? What does this, what pressure do I need to apply there? Yeah. And that's something Orbis is doing. We're also working with a company to build simulators so that we don't have a lost generation of residents who have not gotten the, the right numbers, have not gotten the critical mass of, of cases that, you know, as we've talked about with simulation, we can sit there and encounter every complication in a weekend on a simulator where it could take three years of a residency to see all the different complications. And it's in such a controlled environment, people feel calm, they can discuss it rationally and build up that assessment and judgment and execution skills that I know you have spent decades trying to build in pilots and aviation team members. 
So obviously it's very rewarding from a technical standpoint, flying this very special plane and going to airports that probably you would not normally land as a FedEx uh, pilot. What are some of your greatest memories, the memories that really have stuck with you over the years of volunteering with Orbis? What are the special moments for you at Orbis? So flying the airplane is great, delivering the vehicle, picking it up, you know, moving it. I love going into new places. I love being able to bring the airplane in and that challenge that it brings. So um, operating into unusual places is a joy. But working with the people, I love working with the people. And helping people feel calm and cared about. You know, I've, I've seen patients walk up and they're lost. They don't know what they need to do. They don't know if they're going to be seen. I can't speak their language. They can't speak my language, but I can reach out and, and hold them by the arm and lead them to the next room that they need to go to. I can sit with them. I can help feel help them feel calm that they're being respected and, and going to be seen and, and going to be taken care of. And I love that. I also the 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 joy the results of one of the operations what you guys do for people is incredible it's a, a, a as you also know i have that uh, granddaughter who was born blind and uh, she does have some vision but not much but i know the joy that comes from uh, a child seeing their parent for the first time <laughs> or or a grandparent being able to see their child their grandchild for the first time Th those are incredible or, to, or for somebody to be able to work after they've had that life-saving um surgery it doesn't maybe you don't think of it as life-saving because it's just an eye but it allows them to work and support their family and not be a drain on their community you know i also like working with the donors so i've stayed in 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 ethiopia for example and worked with some with some donors and given them tours of the airplane and showed them what we were doing and what we care about and for me that's really fun uh to to meet the people that are blessing us with uh, with their assistance that's an important important factor because they're making a difference in the world they're allowing us to operate i think um somebody who we all donate what we can and i don't have a lot of money but i can donate my time and i can donate my skills to flying the airplane um if I had a lot of money i'd love to donate that and i do donate cash of course to orbis but uh um but people that are able to give generously and make such a difference in the world are really neat people and to get to know them and to show them around uh, it's an honor for me to work with them as well so i've i've loved um interacting with some of the the donors that come out and see what we're doing out on the on the road yeah and i think not many people know this you know speaking of donors the employees of fedex donated the current orbis plane well, I definitely want to end today's episode the exact same way I started by saying thank you. Thank you for all that you do for Orbis, how you inspire so many people, but especially women and, and young girls to pursue their dreams, whether it's in aviation or medicine or going around the world. Um, just thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that I like to wear my uniform as well. Uh, I wear my uniform when I'm out in speaking engagements. I wear my uniform when I'm helping there in Orbis on the screening day. So I hope that that inspires them. I hope that inspires some of the, the youngsters that we see coming on the airplane for tours or having a family member that's coming along for surgery to maybe pursue a career field in medicine or in uh, in aviation or or whatever it is that interests them the things that we get to see from the cockpit are amazing looking down on the earth and and seeing the world the things that you get to see i think in the operating room are equally amazing as you see people develop and blossom into a um, a better society, a one world that we care about each other. I think that's an important thing that Orbis brings is it's a world that cares about each other. I don't know if I could have said it any better. <laughs> that was Captain Cindy Berwin, a leader in the field of simulation. I am so grateful that she's a part of the Orbis family and grateful that she was able to join us today on Sightlines. Finally, I sat down virtually with Dr. Danny Haddad, Orbis Chief of Program, to talk about how simulation training is playing a key role in Orbis's training programs around the world. Here's that conversation. 
Well, Danny, it's really exciting to see where we are today at Orbis. And, you know, one of the things you've been heavily invested in is simulation. Can you just talk about your experience with simulation and how you want to bring even more of this technology to help our mission? I think when I did my first surgeries, I remember how I was just petrified. And one of the things that, that really impressed me was work that a um, colleague of ours, Dr. Emily Gower from uh, University of North Carolina, did with developing a um, simulator for trachiasis surgery. And the amazing thing is that this is, I actually have it right here on my shelf. Right next to Seymour the teddy bear. Exactly. So the amazing thing is that what they developed was this, this head with eyelid units in there that you could practice your surgery on. And the nice thing is that after you've done the surgery, you could take the eyelid out and you could actually see what you had done. And one of the, the most amazing comments that we received was that surgeons that had done this for many years, when they saw what they had actually done, said, oh, wow, I had no idea that I was doing that. And this is also in a time where the quality of surgery led to large numbers of people getting to chiasis again. And this tool really improved the quality of the training and the quality of the surgery of the surgeons. But when it came to, to Orbis and the work that we were doing, we really saw an amazing opportunity for us to look at establishing what we call wet labs and doing simulation surgery in a wet lab. So a wet lab is basically a room where we have the operating microscope, where we have the surgical instruments, and the resident can practice the surgery in a safe environment. And, and one of the crucial things that, that I always find is, is that people learn the most from their mistakes. So being able to make a mistake in a safe environment, that's of course how you learn to avoid that when you're doing the surgery on the real patient. What we've been able to do at Orbis is create partnerships with groups like the Philips Eye Studio around using artificial eyes within these wet labs to train people on how to do surgery and develop that skills level that you need to have to be able to provide high quality surgery to that patient. Because that is of course our ultimate goal. We wanna make sure that everybody that receives surgery, that the surgery is done in the best quality possible and therefore that the outcome is the best possible outcome. Now, we've been able to do a huge amount of work around simulation surgery. But one of the things that I'm personally most excited about is an opportunity that we got through funding from uh, a really visionary donor, uh, Dr. David Chang, and the Astros Foundation through our Subrato Silicon Valley Innovation Fund. That funding allowed us to develop a virtual reality simulator. So the nice thing is that this is focusing on gaming hardware in 3D virtual reality. We've been working with a group in England to develop the software that you can actually do the surgery in virtual reality and get feedback of where you go wrong. So as a resident, you would try a cataract surgery and it will tell you when you make the incision too big, when you're stabbing too deep in the eye, or when you would even hold an instrument at the wrong angle. This provides an opportunity to provide a training institution with a very sophisticated tool that is very affordable. It's less than $15,000 for one unit that could benefit all the residents for years to come in an eye center. It is portable, so you can even share it between training institutions. No, I, I fully agree. And someone who went through a residency without real simulation programs, and really we didn't have these unbelievable technologies where you put on the Oculus headset and it looks like you're in the OR and you sometimes forget that you're in a video game and you can do and practice one step, like you said, a hundred times 
in a day or two, where to do 100 cases could take six or 12 months. As Orbis, we've always been on the forefront of innovation. And we have that strong link with aviation as well. And I think here we've been able to also learn a lot from our partner FedEx. And mid last year, I, I had the incredible pleasure of visiting uh, the FedEx training facility and seeing how FedEx is investing and structuring the training of pilots and how there are so many similarities when you're looking at that combination of theoretical knowledge and actual skills that you need to have when you're flying a plane and how that translates to ophthalmology. So we've been able to learn a lot around how a group like FedEx is training their pilots. We're using different levels of simulation. And we are trying to, to duplicate that model with virtual reality simulation, after which you can go to a much more sophisticated simulation with artificial eyes that are so realistic now that it almost feels like you're doing surgery on a real patient. So I think that there is such an enormous way for us to to embrace what is already being done by so many different industries. And that's also where our great partnerships with, with academic institutions come into play. We have an amazing network of volunteer faculty from state-of-the-art universities where we are in a position that we can learn from what is being done, what is happening in, in those institutions. What is the latest in artificial intelligence? What is the latest in simulation? And how can we translate that in the work that we do as Orbis and making sure that we keep on that forefront with providing our trainees, our partners with all that technology, all that new innovation from the start. Again, I really am excited to see how we're democratizing these technologies. We're using the best evidence, the best uh, training tools to give best outcomes, both for patient care, but also for education and training. And again, it's just an exciting time to be at Orbis. That was Dr. Danny Haddad. I'd like to thank him and all of our guests today, Captain Cindy Berwin, Dr. Nicholas Shikard, and Dr. Michael Abramoff. Thank you for joining me on Sightlines today. I hope you'll join us for the next episode and for the entire series. If you'd like to learn more about Orbis and the Flying Eye Hospital, please visit us at orbis.org. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch each episode and check out many other videos about our work around the globe. If you're listening to the podcast version of the show, please hit subscribe so you don't miss a future episode. And if you're listening in an Apple podcast, please consider rating or reviewing the show. It really does help others learn about us, about Orbis, and our sight-saving mission. Until next time.